Hello, I'm Tom Kimmel. Ms. Coat, thank you again for that effusive, inflated introduction that I provided for you. Stay with me, folks, and I promise you some facts you have never heard before, some free stuff, and hopefully some fun along the way. After all, it's my job to talk today and your job to listen. Should you finish before I do, then God bless you. That's my uh, grandfather there in the center when I knew him well. Here he is on the right when he was commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet. I was a ripe old age of minus two at the time. <clears throat> this is a listing of the characters, some of the characters in the Pearl Harbor story, not all by any means. You should know that the Pearl Harbor story really boils down to almost everyone in Washington, D.C. versus the Hawaiian Command, Admiral Kimmel and General Short. The important exception is Captain Lawrence Safford the head of Naval Communications Intelligence in Washington, who dared to tell the truth, and without whom there is no Pearl Harbor story as we know it today. Notwithstanding the proceeding, the Pearl Harbor story today still boils down to Washington, D.C. versus Kimmel and Short. In this presentation, my second presentation, I'll discuss secret Pearl Harbor information and who needed to know it but did not. If during my presentation you suspect that I might miss the mark from time to time, please be guided by this graphic. It's always good to have a helper especially one who knows the right thing to do. I'll be calling for some helpers here in a moment. But here's where it started in America for me. Meet Johann Philipp Kimmel. 1695 to 1777. He came to the United States in 1775. Another grandpa. Here we have Admiral Kimmel at age five, and that's his father, the West Point graduate who fought for both the North and the South in the Civil War. Back to the knitting, folks. Here's an example of what happens when need to know fails. Clearly, the police needed one more piece of vital information that they did not have. Consider. In the Pearl Harbor case, magic. Magic was the code name for the vital information that was needed and denied to those who needed it the most. Admiral Kimmel and General Short. Here's a definition of magic. It's a code word for the secret American decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications. Prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, magic provided indications of the time, place, reason, and deceit plan to cover the attack. Hawaii, of course, had no magic. Interestingly enough, the man the President of the United States designated as in charge of internal security, the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, he didn't have any magic either. 
Likewise, the man, the President of the United States, designated as in charge for external security, William Donovan, the coordinator of information, eventually the Office of Strategic Services, and eventually the Central Intelligence Agency, he didn't have any magic either. But recent developments have given a strong indication that the Soviets, meaning Stalin, had magic. All right. With that knowledge in mind, consider this. The Pearl Harbor Investigating Committee hears the testimony of Admiral Kimmel, who was Navy head at Pearl Harbor at the time of the Jap sneak attack. The Admiral has this to say. It is my conviction actions for the Navy Department and anyone of these significant dates in furnishing me the information from the intercepted messages would have altered the events of December 7, 1941. Note well, note the bene, folks. Admiral Kimmel did not receive any of these vital messages listed in the graphic before you. Not one. Or, put another way, we needed one thing which our own resources could not make available to us. That vital need was the information available in Washington from the intercepted dispatches, which told when and where Japan would probably strike. I did not get this information. And for good measure, just in case anyone has missed the point, days before the surprise attack. I cannot understand now. I have never understood. I may never understand why I was deprived of the information available in the Navy Department in Washington on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Okay, it's time to figure out who needs to know. To help me do so, I need two volunteers from the audience. One to role play Admiral Stark, and another to role play General Marshall. Okay, thank you. Consider this, Admiral Kimmel took over as commander of the Pacific Fleet on February 1st. 1941. Two days prior to him actually taking over the fleet, this purple magic secret dispatch was received by the Navy Department in Washington, D.C. and translated six days later. Rather, six days after Kimmel took command. In it, as you can see, Tokyo is telling their ambassador in Washington to de-emphasize propaganda work and start working on intelligence. Reorganize your intelligence setup and put this new program into effect as soon as possible. And incidentally, you are to wire it as minister's orders to, among other places, Honolulu, Hawaii. This was not sent to Admiral Kimmel. The same day, a second remarkable magic dispatch was intercepted and again decoded on February 7th, 1941, but not sent to Kimmel. Here, we have another order from Tokyo to Washington, D.C. to establish an intelligence organization in the embassy. They're told what kind of information they are to gather. They are told who will be the head of the intelligence gathering effort in the Western Hemisphere. And that would be Hindanaro Terasaki. He's on his way to Washington, as this dispatch indicates. Also, we have orders to send this information again on to Honolulu, Hawaii. 
perhaps the most significant piece of information not shared with Kimmel is number eight here, in which the Tokyo authorities tell their ambassador in Washington that they are going to cooperate with German and Italian intelligence organizations in the United States, that this phase has been already discussed with the Germans and Italians in Tokyo, and it's been approved. This message, which came in February 15, 1941, was so important <laughs> that when the FBI finally learned that this thing had been received and not sent to them, they complained mightily in the Joint Congressional Committee report. And they said this information was vital to the FBI <clears throat> to allow it to do its job, but it was not received. Once again, there are orders from Tokyo to Washington transmitted on to Hawaii to pay particular attention in your intelligence work to military preparations in other places to include Hawaii with a complete listing of all the information that Tokyo was hoping to get through intelligence. Hawaii itself did not have a purple machine, a purple magic machine. So here we have Tokyo wiring directly to Honolulu, emphasizing they want intelligence on military preparations in the Hawaiian area, ship and plane movements, in accordance with the previous message that I just discussed with you. Okay, maybe it's time to uh, ask our role-playing Admiral Stark and role-playing General Marshall if they think that Admiral Kimmel had a need to know this kind of information. We have a new set of information. All of a sudden, on November 5th, Tokyo wires to Washington that they have a deadline in mind for Washington to advance Japanese negotiations with the United States, and they set that deadline at November 25th and underscore its importance. No sooner had they done that than they decided to advance the deadline four days to the 29th. They were so insistent on that, they specifically wrote out the 29th. <laughs> and they emphasized that it was <clears throat> terribly important to do this, that the deadline absolutely could not be changed, and after that, things were automatically going to happen. Well, who could possibly read this in our intelligence agencies and not wonder why the deadline? Well, it became clear why the deadline the Japanese were waiting for Secretary of State Cordell Hull's response to the Japanese negotiated position that they had given to the United States. And on November 26, Secretary Hull sent the United States response, which was unacceptable to the Japanese, effectively told the Japanese to get out of China or else. The Japanese wanted to see this response to Japan's latest negotiation. Remember this note. This is very important. The Army Pearl Harbor Board, Board would later style this as the document that touched the button that started the war. We'll talk about it again. Again, through magic, secret decoding of Japanese dispatches, we knew what Japan's reaction was to Secretary of State Cordell Hull's note. The ambassadors in Washington thought that they had failed and were humiliated. 
They thought that the note was unexpected, extremely regrettable, a humiliating proposal. By no means could they use it as a basis for negotiations. Negotiations would be de facto ruptured. This is inevitable. <coughs> In another dispatch <coughs> from the Japanese ambassador in Berlin, Baron Oshima, back to Tokyo, or I should say the other way around, Tokyo to Baron Oshima. Tokyo was telling Baron Oshima to tell Hitler and Ribbentrop. Ribbentrop uh, was the foreign minister for Germany. Tokyo was telling Baron Oshima, say the conversations between Tokyo and Washington last April are ruptured. Say very secretly to them, Hitler and Ribbentrop, that there is extreme danger that war may suddenly break out between the Anglo-Saxon nations and Japan, quicker than anyone dreams. Hmm. This was not sent to Kimmel? Did he not have a need to know this? I'll have to ask our stand-ins for Stark and General Marshall. Another reaction message. Tokyo stated that a continuation of negotiations with the United States was merely a trick and it was insulting. The next series of messages are known as the deceit plan messages. We are now attempting to deceive, deceive the United States by pretending that negotiations are still possible and negotiations are continuing. As you can see from this message, again, from Tokyo to Washington, they do not wish to give the Americans the impression that the negotiations have broken off. They repeat the instructions in another message. Prevent the United States from becoming unduly suspicious. Regarding negotiations, don't break them off. In carrying out these instructions, be careful. This does not lead to anything like breaking off negotiations. The Washington ambassadors were confused, and they went back to Tokyo and said, are the negotiations to continue? Tokyo said, yes. The ambassadors in Washington said, hey, you are very urgent before about having us work rapidly to wrap up the negotiations. But now you want them stretched out. While all that was happening, a new set of Japanese intelligence was being intercepted in Washington, D.C. Most notably, instructions from Tokyo to Hawaii, ordering spies in Hawaii to report ship movements in accordance with a bomb plot. On November 15th, Tokyo ordered the Hawaii spies to report ship movements twice per week. On November 18th, they ordered Hawaii spies to report on vessels anchored at Pearl Harbor. On November 20th, Tokyo ordered Hawaii spies to investigate comprehensively the fleet in Hawaii. And on November 29th, Tokyo went even so far as to order the Hawaii spies to report even when there were no ship movements. There's no reason to report on no ship movements except if you're planning to attack that port. Indeed, remarkably, some have argued that with all of that previous information that I've shown you, you really still can't figure out that Japan intends to attack Hawaii. But consider this. This is the spy, the Hawaiian spy, Yoshikawa. Yoshikawa actually wrote on December 6th, the day before the attack, this spy report back to Tokyo. Unfortunately, it was not translated until the day after the attack or two days after the attack. But Yoshikawa, who only has access to these spy messages and orders from Tokyo, he doesn't know anything about these messages, uh, diplomatic messages. He writes, 
that there is still considerable opportunity left to take advantage for a surprise attack against Pearl Harbor and other military installations in Hawaii. Here's what that means. It was not beyond Yoshikawa's ability to guess. He figured out the plan. And after the pilot message came in, this is a new category of message, an indication that Japan was going to attack Pearl Harbor. Tokyo told the ambassadors in Washington that they would send a separate message, a very long message, in 14 parts. They're going to send it in English. This could capture anybody's imagination. And they also provided that concerning the time for presenting this memorandum to the United States, Tokyo will wire you in a separate message. Well, after that message was received on December 6, 1941, Saturday before the attack, this awakened the Army Security Agency, specifically one of its members, John B. Hurt, who wrote that about midday on Saturday, December 6, 1941, we knew that war was as certain as death. It was known in our agency that Japan would surely attack us in the early afternoon of the following day, not an iota of doubt. Here's the 13th part of that 14th part response that the Japanese wanted delivered to the United States government at a specific time. When this 13th part was shown to the President of the United States Saturday evening at about 9 p.m., he declared, this means war. And I remind you, all 14 parts were transmitted in English. Clearly what the Japanese were doing was attempting to justify what they were about to do, and that is attack the United States at Pearl Harbor and many other places. There will be much more discussion on this particular dispatch in my presentation number four. But now things really come to a head. This will be the final message that the Japanese send prior to the attack. It's the time of delivery message. Tokyo tells the ambassadors in Washington to please submit to the United States government our reply, the 14-part message, at 1 p.m. on the 7th, your time. <clears throat> this finally stirred American intelligence in Washington, D.C. into some action. You might recall that General Marshall wrote a message putting Hawaii on alert, but it didn't arrive in Hawaii until after the attack on December 7, 1941. So why? Why didn't General Marshall just pick up the phone and put Hawaii on alert? Maybe we should refer that to our stand-in General Marshall. What say you? Well, here's what General Marshall testified to under oath at the Joint Congressional Committee alerting the garrisons could be construed as a hostile act, which is why I did not pick up the telephone and put General Short in Hawaii on alert. I turn to you, General. This makes reason stare. It certainly upset Admiral Kimmel. Admiral Kimmel 
after the Naval Court of Inquiry received a letter from Admiral Stark. And Admiral Kimmel prepared a draft response. And I'll end this session with this draft response. Admiral Kimmel wrote to Admiral Stark saying, you, Admiral Stark, betrayed the men of the fleet by not giving them a fighting chance for their lives. You betrayed me by not giving me information you knew I was entitled to. You betrayed me by your acquiescence in the action taken on the request for my retirement. You betrayed yourself by misleading the Roberts Commission as to what information had been sent to me. You betrayed yourself by your self-serving lapse of memory before the Naval Court of Inquiry. I hope that you never communicate with me again and that I never see or hear or see your name again, that my memory may not be refreshed of one so despicable as you. Okay, uh, General Apple, you can be seated now. Join me for the next class, those who can, and we'll talk about Pearl Harbor spying. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I welcome whatever questions you may have.